Hi everybody, welcome to the Parallel Systems Broadcast. I'm your host Mike and thank you so much for joining me for tonight's episode. Tonight we're going to be looking at a very important subject. We're going to be looking at the difference between a debt-based monetary system and a value-based monetary system. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Mike, this sounds a little bit basic. We don't need you to take us to preschool, my friend. Well, I'm taking you anyway, so get your little rucksack on, get your packed lunch and jump aboard the Parallel Systems school bus because we're off back to school. We're going to learn the very basics, the difference between a debt-based monetary system and a value-based one. Now, I know it's pretty simple, but also there's many intricacies of this that people often miss. And I think it's really important to just reflect on why the debt-based monetary system is so toxic and poisonous and how it relates to everything that we're seeing in the world today. All of the war and conflict and misery, all of that is because of the debt-based monetary system, and I'm gonna explain that tonight. Also, if you've got a family member or a friend and you're struggling to get through to them, when you're trying to explain to them the difference between a debt-based system and a value-based system, why gold's so important, and also where money comes from, and why what we call money today is not really money, well, this is the video to share with them. This is the one that will help them to understand. So without further ado, let's get into it. So first and foremost, a debt-based monetary system is one where the creation of money occurs through borrowing. So the money, which is actually currency, it's not real money because it has no intrinsic value. Well, that currency is loaned into existence by a private central bank. So essentially, you've got an authority. In this case, it would be the Federal Reserve or the Bank of England. And they come along and they say to the government, right, your economy needs some currency to function. Otherwise, of course, it's limited to trade and barter. So we need an intermediary. That's what we call currency or money. And they say, we're going to make that currency function. For you Now, that currency isn't actually backed by anything. In a debt-based economy, there is nothing backing it. So they are essentially creating a valueless piece of paper. The central bank loans that into existence by creating it out of nothing, giving it to the government as a debt obligation that the government must in turn pay back in the future to the tune of the same amount with interest added. Now, of course, the interest doesn't exist. And here's where the problems start, my friends. The interest doesn't exist because that currency has yet to be created. All that's created is the initial amount of currency and the debt obligation or the contract between the government and the central bank to say, you will pay us back this money and some additional money, which of course doesn't exist. So we're going to create that too. But guess what? We're going to attach interest to that as well. So now you're going to be even more indebted. And on and on and on it goes with the debt never ending, always rising, because of course, there's never enough money to pay off the actual existing amount. Now, of course, it starts slowly at first. A little bit of interest here, a little bit of interest there. But over decades and then centuries, this debt becomes a massive debt bomb. It's unpayable. But unfortunately, the debt is owed to some private entities, some very powerful private entities who control the military. They control the politicians. They control big industry. And they expect to be paid up in full. Well, that's not quite true because first and foremost, the government is putting up as collateral you and your labor. Therefore, it is your work and your effort that will pay back the so-called national debt. But remember, it's unpayable. And therefore, they're going to tax you harder and harder and harder because the debt gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then over time, because of this system where you have a small group of people creating currency out of nothing, lending it into existence, loaning it at interest that can never be repaid, well, those people benefit tremendously from this system. And this time they start to take people's property. They start to take the land of the nation, the infrastructure. They take over the media. They take over big oil. They take over big energy. And soon before you know it, you have an oligarchal class that own literally anything and everything that is possible to own, wealth inequality skyrockets, and you get this poor servitude class who actually have to go out and work to try and raise enough money to pay their taxes, to pay all of their personal debts. Because remember, in a debt-based system, the price of all assets becomes artificially high, and the people have to take on debt 
to pay it off but of course that debt has interest and on and on it goes in this debt spiral until eventually you get to a societal collapse. Now we're gonna talk more about the consequences of a debt-based economy in a moment, but some of this might be sounding just a little bit odd. It sounds almost too fantastical to be true. So let me just give you a really basic example as to how a debt-based system works, and then we'll compare it to a value-based system, and then we'll discuss it some more. So let's look at this example here in front of us. So here is the debt-based system and I've kept it very basic so anyone and everyone can understand this one. You could teach this to a child using this slide and a little bit of explanation. So when you have a debt-based system, nothing of value is being created to begin with. And that contrasts to a value-based system in which the thing that is going to be used as money has intrinsic value. And by intrinsic value, I mean man's finite resources of time and energy was used to extract it. Therefore, it becomes Becomes an energy embodiment. When you take a piece of gold out of the ground, it requires an awful lot of time and energy. We have to consume calories to be able to go out there to dig that gold up from a mine or to pan for it in the river. Or if you're going to plant a field of wheat to get some wheat, which you're going to use as a currency, you could use oil, you could use lumber, whatever it is. If it's an energy embodiment, it will come from nature and it will require man to use his finite resources of time and energy to extract it. But let's go to our debt-based system and explain why this one doesn't work, why it's valueless, because it begins with nothing of value. No energy embodiment actually exists at the point of creating the currency. The currency itself is loaned into existence and essentially it's just printed or it's digits on a screen. Zero energy is required to create it, therefore its energy embodiment score is zero. It is valueless. Fair to say you simply flooded the system with money. Yes, we did. That's another way to think about it. We did. Where does it come from? Do you just print it? We print it digitally. So we, you know, we as a central bank, we have the ability to create money uh, digitally. And we do that by buying treasury bills or, or bonds or other government guaranteed securities. And that, that actually increases the money supply. We also print actual currency and we distribute that through the Federal Reserve banks. But by law, Chairman Powell's Federal Reserve can only lend money that must be paid back. So let's use this as an example. This is my simple debt-based system. And to begin with, as the central bank, I'm going to loan into existence 1,000 units of currency. Now remember, this currency is a debt. Therefore, it's not a plus to the economy, it's a minus. It means that there is 1,000 units of debt that has been created. Now I'm going to loan that into the economy, I'm going to give it to the government, but I'm going to attach 20 units of interest to it. So now the government has a debt of 1,020 units. However, it only possesses 1,000 units, and the other 20 units that it has to pay me doesn't exist so therefore it's impossible for the government to ever pay back the debt now it could pay back the original 1000 units it could actually do that so now what would happen is the original 1000 units of debt that was created would be extinguished because it's a debt so that would mean that currency no longer exists because the currency is actually debt and if I pay it back, I extinguish the debt and therefore extinguish the currency. Now, there's two problems here. Firstly, there's no currency left and therefore the economy would crash. And secondly, there's still 20 units of interest left over that the government still needs to pay for which the currency doesn't exist. So what's the government going to do? How are they going to pay off that debt? Well, of course, we have to go all the way back to step one and get the central bank to create more units of debt. The problem, of course, here is they're going to attach more interest to it. So now I'm loaning additional money to pay the interest on the old debt, but also to create enough units of debt to furnish the economy once more because there's no currency left. So, of course, we're going to borrow that currency again from the central bank and they're going to attach more interest to it. And we're going to go around this cycle again and again and again. And the interest, of course, because it's unpayable, will just grow and grow and grow until we get to the point where we have a catastrophic collapse of the system because the debt has gotten so large. Now, if you look around the world today, this all might be sounding quite familiar and we'll come back to that one in a moment. But let's just remind ourselves of how a value-based economy works. Like you said, they print the dollar. So why, why does the government even borrow? Well, um, 
the, uh, so the, I mean, again, some of this stuff gets, some of the language that the MM, some of the language and concepts are just confusing. I mean, the government definitely prints money and it definitely lends that money, which is why uh, the government definitely prints money and then it lends that money by, uh, by selling bonds. Uh, is that what they do? They, they, um, they, yeah, they, they, um, they sell bonds. Yeah, they sell bonds, right? Because they sell bonds and people buy the bonds and lend them the money. Yeah, so a lot of times, a lot of times, at least to my ear with, with MMT, the, the language and the concepts can be kind of unnecessarily confusing, but there is no question that the government prints money and then it uses that money to, um, uh, 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 so, um, yeah, I, I guess I'm just, I don't, I can't really talk. I, I don't, I don't get it. I don't know what they're talking about. Like, cause it's like the government clearly prints money. It does it all the time and it clearly borrows. Otherwise we wouldn't be having this debt and deficit conversation. So I don't think there's anything confusing there. So here you can see in front of you a value-based monetary system and it begins in a very different manner because in this system there is 1,000 units of value extracted. Now notice the difference in terms here. In the debt-based system, currency is being created and it is not an energy embodiment because it requires zero amount of time and effort to create, therefore it's valueless. Also, because it's loaned into existence, it begins its life as a negative on the balance sheet sheet of the government who are borrowing it from the privately owned central bank. They now owe 1,000 units or should we say 1,020 units because of course there is interest attached to that debt. In a value-based economy on the other hand the thing that is being used as money is either intrinsically value in and of itself because it's an energy embodiment like gold or silver, it's been extracted from nature and it required man's finite resources of time and energy to extract or in a modern system you could have something that is backed by the energy embodiment. But in this simple example we're going to imagine that that the thing itself that is going to be used as money has intrinsic value because it is an energy embodiment. So it begins its life by being extracted from nature. It's wrought from nature and now 1,000 units of value have been extracted. Now the value is added to the economy. It's not loaned to the economy, it's added to the economy as payment for further value extraction. Now what do I mean by that? Well, I quite simply mean is used to pay people who are also extracting value from nature. So lumberjacks who are chopping down trees, farmers who are growing fields of crops, people who are actually turning metals into tools. Now you've got an economy that is based on real stuff and real value. Now the people who are in the economy are going to extract further value and that's going to be used to pay back the original 1,000 units of value. Only in this instance, it doesn't leave behind any negative. It leaves behind a positive because those 1,000 units of value still exist. It's not something that is created out of nothing. It's something that already has value. So unlike the 1,000 units of debt, which are valueless and once paid back cease to exist, erasing essentially the currency, but leaving behind the after effect of debt in the form of interest, in the value-based system, if a thousand units of value are paid back, those 1,000 units of value can now be redistributed because remember, it's an energy embodiment and therefore it's got use. So with a debt-based system, of course, the debt has to grow exponentially. That is the point of a debt-based system. The original units that are created, the original round of currency has currency that doesn't exist attached to the debt because it's always a debt that's floated into the economy and it has to be repaid with something that doesn't exist, which leads to more debt being loaned into existence and on and on it goes until you get the exponential growth and eventually the collapse. In a value-based system, that is not the case. The debt is limited by natural capacity. And what I mean by that is because the money has intrinsic value, because it is an energy embodiment, there is only so much of it that can be created because of course, there is a natural limiter on the amount of stuff that can be extracted from nature. Similarly, the people who are lending out energy embodiments as a form of money are gonna be far more cautious because they're lending out something of value. Therefore, actual risk is being undertaken by those who lend it. 
Also, it's extremely unlikely that they're gonna be loaning this money out for unproductive uses. They're gonna lend it to the people who are actually working in nature's economy because that is where the energy embodiments lie. If somebody is lending energy embodiments to say, I don't know, sit at the computer screen and watch charts and graphs, well, in a value-based economy, that activity is going to be of far less value than somebody going out and actually working in the fields to produce real energy embodiments that people need to live, survive, and sustain themselves. Those are the activities that are going to have the most value in society, whilst the non-productive activities that only consume energy embodiments but do not create them outright, those activities are going to be of less value and therefore the focus is going to be moved away from those activities and towards real economy activities, industry, farming, people that work with manual labor. Those are going to be the key activities in the value-based society. Of course, in a debt-based society, it's going to be the complete inversion of that the people who are going to be most valued in the debt-based society are naturally going to be the people who can turn currency into more currency, who can artificially create more currency through speculation because, of course, there is no limit to the amount of numbers that can be created in a debt-based system because more debt can always be added. So it's going to cheapen the people who work in the real economy and it's going to laud the people who work in the Ponzi economy and who get really good at turning debt into more debt or currency into more currency. The young farmer today is, is just behind the eight ball as far as being able to get into farming for a number of reasons. It's difficult for him to, to buy land in the first place because he can't uh, finance land and, and pay for it. Your debt service gets too high. But it's so awfully expensive now to to buy equipment, uh, the tractors and the various related pieces of equipment you have to have. It's just young farmers, uh, unless he has some kind of inheritance or something to, to give him some kind of base to operate from. Now another feature of the debt-based system is it is environmentally catastrophic versus the value-based system that is environmentally conscious. Now why do I say that? Well again, in the debt-based system, infinite amounts of debt can be created to fund as much exploitation of nature as possible. Therefore, you can create new units of debt and use that to go extract en masse as many resources as possible to create as many digits as possible. And that, of course, is because the myth of infinite growth has to exist to back up the idea of infinitely expanding debt pyramids. So there is zero environmental accountability in that system because it's all about consumption. So every energy embodiment that is wrought from nature is immediately consumed, not for productive uses, but to ensure that the debt pyramids can continue to expand. And as they get bigger, more extraction has to take place to service that debt, which means it's disastrous for the environment and taken to an extreme can lead to a form of ecocide. And that is a direct result of an economy that is based on consumption in which everything is globalized to try and find the cheapest, most efficient ways of extraction because the people who work in nature's economy have been devalued. Therefore, local economies are decimated in favor of globalized economies that are environmentally troubling so that more and more cheap extraction can happen because the value is being applied towards the Ponzi economy rather than the real economy. Now compare that with a value-based economy. Of course, in a value-based economy, the most valuable jobs, as I've already said, are the ones where people are extracting resources, energy embodiments from nature. Now you might think that would lead to the same consequence, that people would simply extract as much as possible from nature to increase the amount of energy embodiments that they have to sell and use in the economy. However, don't forget the money itself is an energy embodiment. Therefore, inflation doesn't exist. So there is not a constant need for people to try and chase more and more of these currency units to pay an ever-expanding debt pile. Because of that also, taxation will be extremely low. So this leads to an economy that is actually balanced. People don't have to work harder and harder just to survive, just to keep their head afloat. In fact, in a circular economy, a value-based economy, particularly one in which something like gold is being used as the money, 
there is actually a natural limiter because there is only so much of that money that can be extracted and it's extremely hard to find. Therefore, even if somebody is trying their very hardest to get that stuff out of the ground, they have to expend energy to get it. And at some point it becomes no longer economically viable to try and take more than at a set rate. So therefore there is an environmental limiter and that is better for nature. It limits things by default. And of course, people spend a lot more time creating things that are actually necessities of life, things that people need, and a lot less time creating things that are purely for consumption. Of course, the next one is that the debt-based system builds massive gross wealth inequality, and that's because there is somebody out there, there is a small group of people who get to create the money out of nothing. Yes, they get to create the money out of nothing. They can hand it off to their friends before the inflation arrives. They can then buy up real assets with it. Meanwhile, people who don't have those privileges, well, they've got to get into debt just to buy the basic necessities of life. And they have to pay interest on that debt, but they also have to pay interest in the form of taxation for the national debt. So you've got this gross inequality that just embeds itself generation after generation. At one end of the spectrum, it creates a permanent oligarchy. And at the other end, it creates a permanent underclass, a slave class, and that's exactly what we have. Another consequence of the debt-based system is hyper-financialization. That's exactly what happened after they finally and irrevocably took the gold out of the system in 1971. It led to the explosion of derivatives markets and debt, public, corporate, private. There's debt everywhere. It's coming out of our ears. It's coming out of our pockets. It's certainly coming out of those cash machines. Yep, that's all debt too. So we got this massive hyper-financialization and that's why we've got these derivatives that now go to the tune of many quadrillions. Well, why not? Because you can print an infinite amount of debt-based money. Now, of course, in a value-based system, that is impossible because the money itself is a real commodity that requires those two things, time and energy to extract. Therefore, in a value-based system, there is value to the real economy. It stops hyper-financialization because there is no use in producing too much wheat. There is no use in chopping down all the trees. You only need to take what you need. It creates an economy that is based on natural cycles. Of course, the money in the economy itself is real stuff. So people can save it. They don't have to constantly be chasing the dragon, the debt dragon, as their currency inflates away and it destroys the quality of their life. Which goes on to the next one, that a debt-based system is highly inflationary. And that, of course, is because in a debt-based system, they have an infinite amount of currency that they can create and they have to keep creating it to pay off the interest on the old debt. And of course, because a debt-based system becomes infinitely corrupted, they continuously print it also for all manner of things. So they will get nations into war, they'll print it for scam. Well, let's not say it. <laughs> let's not say it. There's a demic somewhere in there, but can't put those things together. But you know what I'm talking about. That is the other consequence of a debt-based system. They can literally print the money to enslave the masses. A small group of people can capture the system because, of course, They'll print the money to control politics. They'll print the money to control industry. And all it takes is a few generations for this oligarchy to form. And it's done, of course, through usury, through debt slavery. And after that, well, it's good night Vienna, as they say. Everyone else is screwed. A value-based system, like when we was on a gold standard, well, CPI remains flat. You don't have price inflation. And I can prove that with some charts that I'm going to throw up on the screen. Another thing that a debt-based system does is it leads to massive speculation in the financial market that are created for that exact reason to allow the debt to be soaked up and also to siphon it off to the pockets of the super rich. So you have malinvestment and excessive speculation. If you look at this chart in front of you and it shows you what happened when the Federal Reserve was created, it went on to create also with it this boom and bust cycle from which we have never ever escaped. Meanwhile, debt has skyrocketed, inflation has skyrocketed, inequality has skyrocketed. That's the debt-based system. A few more things that a debt-based system does, it promotes big government over small government, it devolves into oligarchism like I've already said. In a value-based system, it requires the wealthy to actually adopt risk. Therefore, they have a natural limiter on their wealth becoming too 
obscene. And the reason for that, of course, is because in the value-based system, they actually have to lend out something that has intrinsic value. So they have a real risk of capital loss. In a system where they can literally print the money to lend it out like commercial banks do today, or the central bank can just create it out of nothing, there is no risk. And of course, if anything does go wrong, well, it's bailout time. <laughs> oh yes, they're gonna get a bailout. But don't worry, you can pay for it with inflation and taxation. That's the name of the game. Of course, in a value-based system, that doesn't happen because they have to be very careful who they lend to. So they're only gonna lend to enterprises that are also seeking out energy embodiments. Enterprises that they feel will definitely give a return. So it'll be things like farming, things where you're extracting resources, oil, gas, lumber. In the debt-based system, it doesn't matter. Let's create a casino around shit coins. Let's pump Pepe coin to the moon. Let's create pets.com and well.com and all these other useless nonsense companies, which we can then speculate on in the stock market and we can take all the money. And don't worry, the public's gonna pay for it. Let's give them some more QE. Yeah, <laughs> give them another dose of QE. That'll shut them up. That is the debt-based system. That's why we have the world we've got today in a value-based system. None of that is possible because of the natural limiters. That's what I'm trying to get across. What else do we have on this list? We've got collateral is looted from the nation. That's why you've got things like the great taking. That's why they're putting up all of your stocks and bonds as collateral because the banks, they ain't gonna lose. And even though they created the system, they're gonna come out on top. On the other hand, in the value-based system, the currency itself is money. So that is collateral. You don't have to have all of your money sat there in financialized assets that can have the rules rewritten around them and then have them siphoned off in some kind of market crash to the biggest banks to pay off their derivatives portfolio. No, you don't have to do that. You can just keep the money. It's good stuff. It'll last the test of time. Moving along, of course, in the debt-based system, it's literally designed for war and all other manner of things because they can print the money for it. Why do you think we've had over 500 years of perpetual war is because they can print the money for war. That's how they got nations into debt to begin with because they would lend them money to fund the war that they actually antagonized between two countries. That's why we have perpetual war. That's why it will never end. The military industrial complex, big pharma, owned by the same people who own the banks. A value-based system, on the other hand, well, it doesn't have people capturing the energy supply. It doesn't have people capturing healthcare. And it certainly doesn't have people funding perpetual war because you simply cannot afford it. So nations are much more want to not go to war and to use diplomacy rather than send in the gumbo, send in USS dodgy dildo or whatever it is they're calling their aircraft carriers these days. Now let's move on to a little bit of an example as to how this great value-based economy would work. And I'm going to use the farmer's market. Imagine yourself going to a farmer's market. Now you are a small holder yourself. You grow a little bit of wheat. You've got a cow out back called Daisy and every day you're milking that cow to get some delicious raw milk that you're going to sell to some of your neighbors because you simply can't drink it all for yourself. You've got some chickens. You've got about 20 of them out back producing way more eggs than you need. So you're gonna to go to a farmer's market, but at this farmer's market, you're gonna use as a currency, bushels of wheat. Everyone needs bushels of wheat. You need it to feed Daisy in the winter. Your neighbor needs it to make bread. Everyone needs a little bit of wheat. So you're gonna use wheat as a currency. Now, since wheat has value on its own, it's intrinsically value. And of course, it took time and energy to create. It can be eaten, it can be given to Daisy, or it can be stored for a time. Well, people know that it's worth something, it's tangible. So it's always gonna have a value to your community and no one can just create more bushels out of thin air. If you want more bushels, you have to put in more time and energy. So it will always retain an intrinsic value. That would enable trade to remain fair and nobody would be able to go into infinite debt in that system. Everyone knows what they've got has intrinsic value. So people are happy in the economy. They're happy to create, to use, to store. And of course, people can get the goods they need by using this currency, which in this instance is bushels of wheat. Now, of course, bushels of wheat is not an ideal money. Ideal money has to fit to some very specific characteristics for it to last the test of time. And it just so happens that God created some of that as well. It's called gold and it ticks all the boxes, but I'm not gonna get into that in this video. I've done it before, so let's move on. Now, in the dodgy, fake Ponzi economy, instead of having this beautiful, happy farmer with all of her produce that she spent lots of hours 
and time and energy working to create, you end up with parasites like this. Look at the state of this. This thing is lauded as the philanthropist. This guy is a genius. He's an entrepreneur. He's a visionary. No, he's a criminal and he stole all of your money if he was in the crypto space. Now look at that desk. What does he actually have there? I can see uh, I can see some table salt. Is that lubricant? I can see a box of tissues. There you go. That's the visionary that the media was selling you on. Why do you think the media was selling you on that character of this tramp being a visionary and somebody that you should invest your money with? Do you think that was because they were in on it? <laughs> Maybe there was. Maybe the establishment wanted you to have a serial masturbator as your hero. Well, not for me. We ignore that guy. We're the farmers. We're going to the value-based markets and this guy is the debt market yeah <laughs> he's a debt sponge his hair's a debt sponge look at the state of that he looks like he's uh, just been put in a giant ear hole and swelled around and then brought back out and that's what we've got okay let's move on what else does a debt-based system does well of course a debt-based system promotes massive overconsumption, and it's interesting everything hyperinflates in a debt-based system not just the money supply, not just inflation, but also people's waistlines. Why is that? Why do we have an obesity epidemic with children? Why do we have the sickest generations in history? Why is everyone in the West so addicted to pharma drugs? Well, that's because in a debt-based system, they will do anything and everything to make people consume their stuff. Stuff they don't need, stuff they don't want. And if you don't need it, well, they'll make you need it or they'll make you addicted to it. In a value-based system, it's all about nature. It's about going back to what is required, what is needed, and nothing more. That is real living. That's why you've got these happy little gals out there with the chickens feeding them. And on the left, you've got somebody who lives inside a house in America eating. God knows what. Poor kid. His parents failed him. His society failed him. That's the debt-based system. In a debt-based system, your God is consumption, dead materialism. The only thing that matters is that you continue to consume. You should have more. You need more. You want more. <laughs> oh, you're going to get some more. More debt because that's what the debt-based system is all about. Massive overconsumption. In fact, you could call it a satanic system. If you remember in the Bible, when Jesus was out in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, the devil appeared to him. And what did he offer him? He offered him stuff, materialism. He said, you can own all of this. He took him to the highest peak and he said, look at everything you can see. You can be the master of it all. You can own the lot. Well, that's what Satanism is all about. It's about hyper-materialism. And that is the society that we've got. That is a debt-based system. That is why in the Bible, it says that usury is a sin. And the Lord's Prayer, what does it say? Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who debt against us. Of course, they changed that later on because it was a little bit close to the truth. But that's what it's all about, my friends. It's always been about that. It's about usury, debt, slavery versus community charity, goodwill. That's what the value-based system is designed for. Now, like I said, human beings are flawed. So a value-based system is not going to lead to a perfect society, but it will enable the foundations to be laid for that great society. That is the difference. A debt-based system, the foundations are toxic. It's rotten from the very beginning. In a value-based society, you're creating the right foundations so that you have a chance of creating that Garden of Eden here on earth. And if it messes up, well, it's only down to you. That is why God provided us with all of that gold, the natural money. That's why he put it there. So we had a chance. We had a shot. Of course, human beings came along and they mucked it up because some of those people are anti-Christ. And I'm talking here about the spirit of the anti-Christ. That's what we've got, unfortunately. Now, here's some charts that I wanted to show you. These charts are going to show you how a debt-based system impacts society. It's going to show you it in nice, plain, simple graphics. So the first one is the Consumer Price Index, which I popped up earlier. Well, it's back. This is from 1800 onwards. And what you can see is from 1800 to 1910, 
we had virtually flat consumer price inflation. Now, just because you have a value-based economy, it doesn't mean you have no inflation because of course, commodities are affected by seasons. So for example, if you're planting lots of wheat, maybe you have a failed harvest one year. Maybe the global supply because of weather changes or climate changes is affected and that will lead to a spike in the price. So there will always be fluctuations based on supply and demand. But what you can see is on the whole, if you expand that out over 100 years, and we had almost 300 years of zero inflation. I've got a chart for that as well, which I'll try and find. But what you'll see is there was pretty much no consumer price inflation. It was stable. But then look what happened here. We got the central bank. We got those banksters back in 1913. You had the period going up to the 1929 crash. We had a boom and then we had a bust. It was called the Great Depression. We also had World War One, World War Two the Spanish flu, and then we came out of that with another few years before more war and more debt, and then we had this massive price inflation, which you can see here on the chart. In this next chart, we have public debt. This is public debt, and you can see we're now nearing 36 trillion, but you haven't seen anything yet. Yes, we are doubling the debt now every few years. The doubling time is going to speed up. You can see we're getting to that point where the chart goes just literally straight up. It took hundreds of years to get to that first trillion. Now they're doing a few trillion every few months. This is end game stuff, my friends. This is what happens when you have a debt based system and you arrive towards the end point. Next chart is M2. This is the money supply. Again, we're getting to the hyperbolic phase of this. If you want to know what real inflation was in Great Britain and in Europe and in the US over the past few years, well, it was double digits in some places. It was over 20%. Now, why is that? Well, it's because now that only option is to print as much money as possible to keep the system alive. Yes, it's on life support after QE 1, 2, 3, twist and all of the other financial manipulations they've done, taking interest rates to record lows to keep these bubbles inflated they run out of runway. And now the only way to keep it going is to dump money into the bank accounts of people to go out and spend it to make it look like the economy is still alive, but it's not alive. It died a long time ago. It's a zombie. It's a zombie and it's on life support and it's going to fail. It's going to fail at some point. And that is why we're seeing inflation now, because all they can do is keep this money supply increasing. And I'm sure by this point, you know what I'm going to say next. It can never be paid off. It can only go up and go up faster and faster. Yes, you got it right, my friends. You've passed your degree. Here is your diploma. You now understand the difference between a debt based system and a value based system. Now, here are the consequences for you and your family. In this chart, you can see the inflation adjusted national minimum wage in the USA. And what do you see? Well, you see a catastrophe. You see that today people are earning less dollars per hour when we look at it inflation adjusted than they have at any other point over the past 70 years. Yes, you heard me right. Less than at any point over the past 70 years. You can see that red line there and the inflation adjusted amount has gone way below that. So we're going all the way back to the 1950s, just after World War II. So essentially, people right now are being hung out to dry. This is the end game of a debt-based system. And finally, this is the share of total net worth held by the top 1%. And what do you see? Well, you see that you're being looted with each and every crisis. Right now, the top 1% hold more wealth than at any other point over the past century. In fact, the last time the top 1% had this share of wealth and inequality was this bad, well, it led to society starting to collapse in on itself and we had two world wars. And that's really the fear, isn't it? That people have become so disenfranchised, they feel like the system is so corrupted, so unsalvageable, that they now are looking for heroes, they're looking for anything they can cling on to, to give them that hope that things are going to get better, but it can get better. You can't vote in a politician to fix this. That's not possible. It ain't going to happen. Those guys work for the guys who create the debt, the debt that you use as money, but it isn't money, it's debt. Similarly, it doesn't matter if you pick capitalism or socialism or communism. If you have a debt-based system, it will always end up in catastrophe for the everyday man and woman. Look at it now. We've got capitalism. Everyone says, oh, it's capitalism, cowboy capitalism. And look, we've still got totalitarianism coming our way. It doesn't matter what system you choose. If it's a debt-based system, it's going to lead to misery, war, and taken to its logical conclusion, 
societal collapse. So what can you do about it? Well, firstly, I would share this video with anyone who you think might benefit from understanding what is going on in the world and why we have so much conflict, why we have all of these crazy ideologies, why everything is a psyop right now. Well, it's to keep you confused and it's to keep you fighting one another rather than realizing the source of our troubles. Because like I said, almost everything that we are facing in terms of problems in this world stem from the monetary system that we have, which is a debt-based system. So share this video with people. Secondly, the other thing that you can start to do if you haven't already, is to orientate yourself towards the value-based system. And that is a great idea right now because even if society doesn't adopt that value-based system, the consequences of the debt-based system is to actually reward the people who have taken those steps to orientate themselves towards value. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, you don't have to save in debt. You don't have to save in something that is a debt obligation that can and will be defaulted on. You don't have to fund the Ponzi by owning government bonds and allowing them to perpetuate this sick and dying system. Similarly, you can invest your wealth towards things that actually add value. You can choose to invest in things that create energy embodiments, for example, good companies, not Ponzi companies that create AI or other tools of enslavement. You can stay away from the crazy speculative bubbles that are a consequence of the debt-based system and that always end up in lots of people losing what they've got and ending up in misery. And that's really what the debt-based system does. It degrades society, it removes morality and creates immorality. It leads to people becoming envious, greedy, narcissistic, low in compassion is a me 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 society and most people lose most people lose it all in the end and then they're so weakened by those losses that they get taken towards some kind of hellish end some kind of war or some other crazy end point that nobody would choose to do but when somebody's poor hungry desperate well they get psyoped into it now that is the end game for a debt-based system you don't want to be there so you've got to start creating value and this can start at home it can start in your own life you can start to grow real food saving real money you can reject some of the trappings of the debt-based system some of the nonsense the hollywood the dodgy music the sporting events yeah none of that actually matters it's all a part of the illusion of a system that is still functioning and it's there to trap you so that you're there during the end game. Well, you can say goodbye to it. You can start to live a more natural way. You can go back to the value-based system. And I think if you do that, you will probably survive what comes next because you'll be ready for it. Because guess what happens when the whole pyramid collapses? It's like some blocks that are being stacked on top of one another. The first few levels of blocks are the real value that exists. That's the food. That's the gold, the silver, the energy embodiments, the oil, the lumber. But on top of that, you've got all of the Ponzi economy. You've got block after block after block of financialized assets, of debt and derivatives. Well, when the chickens come home to roost and all of that debt is defaulted on and all of those financialized assets fail, which is what's going to happen in the end game, there is not enough chairs in this game of musical chairs. There's only a little bit of value at the bottom. And of course, people are going to rush into gold because that's real money. That's why the central banks are buying record levels of gold. That's why citizens are buying record levels of gold. Now, I'm going to leave it there for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know in the comment section what you think the differences between a debt-based system and a value-based system are. Maybe I missed something. If so, leave it in the comments. Also, if you'd like to support me and my show, please check out my Patreon page, patreon.com slash parallel systems. On there, I do audio newsletters pretty much weekly now. Similarly, I also put out my homesteading videos. I talk about what we're doing here on the farm to get ready for the harder times ahead, which I hopefully have demonstrated in this video are likely on the horizon, but fear not, there's plenty you can do. So check out the Patreon for more information. In closing, take care of yourselves. Thanks for watching, and I will see you all in the next one.